Hi, today we're going to talk about power and then we're also going to compare the energy approach to analyzing uh, situations to the force approach. So that sets us up for our two goals. We'll simply define and then discuss power a little bit and then we'll step back and we'll look at these two methods we now have to solve problems. Energy conservation, which we learned about recently, and then we'll compare that to the force and constant acceleration method, which we learned about uh, starting a few weeks ago. Okay, so let's talk about power. So there's quite a connection between power and energy. So your average power, or the average power in a, situ in a certain situation, is simply the rate at which work is done, the average rate at which work is done. We're talking about the average power. So all you got to do is divide work by the time required to perform the work, and that is your power. Okay, so here's our equation, work over time. We can write that as just W over T, where W stands for work, T stands for the time interval during which that work is done. You okay, be a little careful here because the unit on power is the watt, which also is symbolized with, a, with the letter W. So the W in the equation, W over T, is the work. This uh, W down here for the unit is the watt. Okay, so don't get that mixed up. And one watt is one joule per second. So for instance, a 100 watt light bulb is using up energy at the rate of 100 joules every single second. Okay, so work, of course, is change in energy. So another way to define work, uh, power is as the change in energy over time. There's lots of units we could use. We're going to stick with watts for the most part. But you may have heard um, car engines or trucks or something rated in horsepower. And one horsepower turns out to be equivalent to about 746 watts. And if you go back to the uh, English system, you're in foot-pounds per second then you're uh, 550 foot-pounds per second. We'll tend to avoid those units and stick with the watt for the most part. But there is a little bit of history here. You know, uh, this really came about when um, the steam engine was being invented, and James Watt, after whom the unit, the watt, is named, was uh, very big at the beginning of this steam engine uh, boom. Okay, and what he wanted to do was to compare his steam engine against the power system for uh, travel, for instance, at the time. And that was, you know, hook your cart up to a bunch of horses, and then the horses provide the, um, the power to move things around. Okay, so he wanted to compare a steam engine to, to those. So he looked at how much work a horse could do, typically. Defined that as one horsepower and compared his steam engines to that. Okay, we can also define power in terms of velocity, so one way to do it is to simply define an equation that looks a lot like the work equation, except instead of uh, displacement, it's got velocity in it. So power is the magnitude of the force multiplied by the magnitude of the velocity multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the force and velocity vectors. Okay, so in some cases, force and velocity are going to be parallel to each other, and then we can simplify our equation to power is F times V. F times V would be positive if the force and velocity are in the same direction. F times V would be negative if the force and velocity are in opposite directions. Okay, so let's apply what we've learned here and calculate the power of you, the power of an average human being. So how are we going to do that? Well, one thing we can do is we can say, we'll make an assumption that the daily output of energy is equal to your daily input of energy. That's about 2,500 capital C calories. So, first of all, this is a pretty good assumption as long as you do not gain or lose weight over the course of the day. That's approximately true for most of us. And what about this capital C calorie? Well, it turns out that food calories are actually kilo calories, kilo small c calories. So this is, in fact, 2,500 capital C calories is 2.5 million, 2.5 times 10 to the 6, small c calories. Okay, so calorie is not a, an, an SI unit, really. So we're going to stick with joules. 
as our energy unit as we've done so far. So one little c calorie is approximately four joules and so 2.5 million calories is in fact around 10 billion joules. So that's what we take in during the course of a day in the form of food energy, 10 billion joules. Okay, so there's our energy, but now we need to find power. So what else do we need? Well, we need a time. And we're talking about one day. We've taken the energy input uh, over the course of a day. So we need to know the time. How long is a day? Well, if we wanted units of joules per uh, day, then we'd be set already. It's 10 billion joules per day. But we really want to go with watts, so we'll convert to uh, seconds. So we need the number of seconds in a day. So we get 60 seconds in a minute multiplied by 60 minutes in an hour multiplied by 24 hours in a day to get us the total number of seconds in one day, 86,400 seconds every single day. Okay, so that's approximately 100,000. We'll just approximate this calculation. So our energy output is 1 times 10 to the 7 joules in a time period of around 1 times 10 to the 5 seconds. So that's approximately 100 watts. If you do it more exact, then you're a little over 100 watts, but it's nice to, that's a nice round number. And the neat thing is we're about as bright as your average light bulb, at least your average incandescent light bulb. Now, of course, we've done some averaging here. This is your average power, averaged over the entire day, including times when you're asleep. And most of us, when we're asleep, have a power output quite a bit less than we do when we're awake. Now, there are other times during the day when um, your power output would be a lot larger than this. For instance, if you go out for a run or a bike ride or do something really strenuous, rock climb or whatever, then there will be certain times during the day where your power output is quite a bit more than this. But averaged over the day, you're around 100 watts, typically. Okay, so now we'll step back a little bit and just look at are two big approaches to solving problems. One is to apply conservation of energy ideas, and the other is what we did before that, where we drew a lot of free body diagrams, we wrote out Newton's second law, found the acceleration, and then you can take that acceleration that you find from doing the forces and throw that into the constant acceleration equations to find distances and times and speeds and things like that. Okay, So in some cases, one method would be preferred over another one. One might be a little easier. In other cases, there's really no reason why one would be preferred. Uh, in other cases, it's very hard to do one method, and, and the other one works pretty well. Okay, so we'll talk about those issues for a few minutes. So here's an example. We have a box sliding down a frictionless ramp, starting from rest. We know how far the box block goes along the ramp. And the angle of the ramp, we also know that. It's constant angle. And so from that, we could figure out, for instance, the height that the block falls through. So if our goal is to find the speed that the block has when it gets to the bottom of the ramp, should we use energy or should we use force to solve this problem? OK, so let's consider energy. Well, energy is perfectly set up to relate very efficiently positions and speeds. That's exactly what we have in this problem, so energy could certainly be used here, no problem at all. How about force with constant acceleration? Let's see, if we analyze the forces as the thing comes down, the frictionless incline, figure out your acceleration is g sine theta, throw that into the constant acceleration equations, find the speed, no problem at all. Okay, so we've done that, we know how to do that, we're good at that. We could apply either method, they're really equivalent. Energy might be slightly faster, but either one would work. Okay, same box, coming down the frictionless ramp, but we want to know something else. We want to know how long it takes, how much time it takes the block to come down this ramp. How about energy? Can we apply energy conservation to this? Well, not really, and that's because energy all by itself is perfect for relating positions and speeds, but it really all by itself tells us nothing about time. Now, sometimes you can combine energy analysis with, say, constant acceleration or average velocities, things like that, and figure out the time that way, but energy all by itself 
really has no information about time built into it. How about force? Piece of cake to do it with force. We've done it before. Find that acceleration, throw it in the constant acceleration equations, solve for time, we're all set. Okay, one last consideration here, one last um, scenario. A pendulum. A pendulum, simply a ball hanging down from a string. Pull the ball back, let it go from rest, then oscillates back and forth, back and forth, acts as a pendulum. We know the length of the string. We know the angle the string makes with the vertical at the point the ball is released. And from that, we could do some geometry and figure out the height that the ball is when we let it go compared to where it is at the lowest point in the swing. And if we want to know the ball's maximum speed during the swing, should we use energy or force? Well, first of all, where is it going to hit maximum speed? It's going to hit maximum speed at the lowest point. And can we apply energy here? Energy is absolutely perfect for this, relating positions, which we know a lot about, to speeds. That's what we're interested in. Energy is perfect for that. How about force and constant acceleration? Well, it would be a little tricky to apply that, those ideas here. And the reason is, is that as the ball swings, the free body diagram is going to change. Okay, the tension is going to be a different direction. The tension is actually going to be changing size. Okay, so that makes the acceleration not constant. And so a force analysis is actually a little bit tricky to do. Okay, so energy is perfect here. Force is uh, a little more problematic. Okay, so that's a good uh, comparison and contrast between these two major approaches we have for analyzing problems. Okay, so that is it for today.